you uh, for having us. So our session today um, is, as um, you introduced us, thank you so much, is about um, how the Sovereign Tech Fund um, works between nerds and governments in order to demonstrate one approach towards digital sovereignty. Um, and we're basically advocating for a more collaborative, secure, and open digital future. Um, and before we get too deep, um, we know that the term digital sovereignty maybe raises some questions for you. And what that means is it sort of pseudo-nationalist, and I'm here to reassure you that it is not. Um, when we talk about digital sovereignty, we are talking about the self-determined use of technologies by individuals, organizations, companies, and governments. So for us, ensuring digital sovereignty and fostering open source are actually two closely related and inter in intertwined goals. And that means that um, as we sort of introduce the work that the Sovereign Tech Fund does today and how it's a new kind of public organization that is at the intersection of nerd politics and digital governance, we will illustrate this approach um, and how we foster digital sovereignty, security, and innovation. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, maybe mm -hmm. perhaps a quick word on who we are. Um, so I'm Paul, uh, I'm a project coordinator at the Sovereign Tech Fund, and I'm also responsible for quantitative research. Um, so trying to address the question of what our impact is, uh, and I'll let Poen yeah. say a few words. Yeah, and my name is Poen Shah. Um, I work in our, on our communications uh, side of things. Um, part of our mission is also to highlight the basic uh, and foundational technologies that power so much of our world. And so I'm really excited to actually be here today and be able to do a little bit of that and sharing the work that we do with you. Um, so just to give you an idea of what we're gonna talk about in the next, let's say, 15 minutes, we'll definitely have time for questions and discussion at the end, is we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what the Sovereign Tech Fund is, what our mission is, um, what our approach and the details. As you know, implementation is uh, a big part of all of these kinds of ideas and projects. And then we'll continue and look a little bit about our theory or our philosophy on what the role of the state is, what the role of governments and countries and um, public administrations is, and looking at digital infrastructure, also at open source as a category. Um, and then because we find it also hard to talk very theoretically about what it means to be a foundational technology or basic uh, digital infrastructure. We'll have two uh, projects that we've supported as an example and talk a little bit about those and then finish out with um, your questions. All right. What is the Sovereign Tech Fund? Um, so we are really um, in sort of government and public terms, a pretty new organization. Uh, the Sovereign Tech Fund started in approximately in October 2022 um, by our two founders, uh, Fiona Krakenberger and Adriana Gro, in Germany. And um, these founders, they've had experience in open source funding. Um, they've worked at the Prototype Fund and at the Open Technology Fund, um, and basically were in uh, already planning this and thinking a lot about how we can support digital infrastructure um, during the time when there were concerns uh, during the Trump administration in the US about ending support, ending the funding for a lot of the free and open source software that existed. So they had um, written a feasibility study, I think in 2021, um, in partnership with the Open Knowledge Foundation to explore what some potential mechanisms might be for this kind of financial support and strengthening the open source ecosystem. And um, I don't know if you would call this luckily, but in uh, December 2021, when the Log4J and Log4Shell uh, crisis happened, it provided a crucial impetus for um, the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action to take this um, concept or take this feasibility study and implement it. And then, um, so basically right now, we are funded through the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. We received 11 and a half million euros in 2023 to invest in the open source ecosystem and 17 million euros this year uh, in 2024. Can I pass this to you for a second? Well, that's my alarm that's going off. No worries. Thank you. So what is our mission? Um, the Sovereign Tech Fund, uh, this is on our website. It's the most important sentence I think that I memorized when I started, or not because I'm gonna read it to you. So we support the development, improvement, and maintenance of open digital infrastructure. Our goal is to sustainably strengthen the open source ecosystem 
And um, as in almost every presentation that we do, we have to include this XKCD comic because it very <laughs> aptly illustrates the fundamental problem in all of modern digital infrastructure, which is that so many, uh, it's, first of all, it's very fractured. There's many small parts that are used in places that nobody ever really knows. And a lot of those things are created and maintained by some random person. You know, it could be Nebraska, it could be Taipei, it could be uh, Berlin, which is where we are. So um, basically, when we think about these foundational technologies that are, that are represented by these blocks, um, we look at them and try to find, uh, or sorry, to so explain a little bit of what they are. Um, currently, we're, we funded over 40 um, at the most current count, and these technologies are often um, basically what developers use to build software, um, so nothing that is exactly what we would ne necessarily call um, end user facing, nothing, no app that you can open on your phone or on your computer. Um, but there's things like libraries that are called in uh, applications, there are standards that need to be developed or implemented, um, open implementations of those standards, for example, or package man managers. And as I said, we'll have a few examples of these uh, later in the talk. Um, and the fundamental problem with these open digital technologies is that they are overutilized so basically, everybody is using them. They're, they're built in to so many different parts of what we're doing in uh, phones, in IoT devices, in routers, um, in cars, or probably in the light bulbs in this room. Um, and they're under-resourced, which means that the companies that are, or the people, or the other organizations that are using these technologies, they don't necessarily say, oh, well, yeah, um, we're building something, and we use some open source library. Let's make sure that we send this developer, um, you know, send her, $10 a month or 10 euros a month or 100 euros a month or even necessarily even get in contact to say like what's happening and how can we help you what do you need well although it would be really important to that uh, to the supply chain basically of these um, and the value chain of protecting your business if you were building let's say a smart light bulb that included um, a library or a tool that um, that is maintained by an open source community um, and it's actually funny because, or funny, haha, -ha, in, in a sad way, is that it's, it's actually because of the success of the free and open source software movement. These tools are so wonderful and so great. The system of people building what they need and putting it out there for other people to use is so wonderful that it means that everybody's using it. And so that's the problem, though, is because there was never a mechanism built in to make sure that these tools continue to be maintained, continue to be supported, and that as all things do, they need to be updated and kept, um, kept relevant or to kept uh, secure for the future. So um, as our goal, part of our goal is to highlight these technologies, which is what we're doing today, talking to you about them, and making a case for governments to take a more active role in securing and sustaining these technologies. So just like we often cite um, the book uh, Roads and Bridges, um, can you remind me what the name of the author is? Uh, Nadia Akbar. Thank you, Nadia Akbar. Um, Basically, these digital roads, digital roads and bridges um, also need to be within the realm of the work of the government or of states that they're, they're, they support our economy, they support um, all sorts of things that we're doing in civil society and public administrations and organizations. And um, there is some role we advocate for, for the government to make sure to secure and, uh, these technologies and make sure they continue to exist. So how do we do that? What's the kind of SDF approach to this very fragile uh, ecosystem that we saw there? Um, well, we try and support a kind of culture of openness and co-creation, interdependency, and interoper interoperability. Um, and for us, that is the kind of route to what we think of as digital sovereignty that Poen explained a moment ago. Um, and of course, you know, we're talking about open source ecosystems. So uh, as the comic implied, you know, these are often individual maintainers or small groups of people. Um, and we're coming from the German government, you know, maybe a kind of fairly monolithic sort of entity organization and don't want to upset these ecosystems, but at the same time kind of give them the best support we can. Um, and that means we have to take a, you know, a fairly kind of targeted approach, I guess. Um, and the overall goal on this is really to reduce dependencies on these kind of monopolistic structures that we have in sort of the digital infrastructure environment. Um, and so really what this looks like, um, as you might imagine, uh, is a set of questions like, that we are trying to address through our work, really. So what's the responsibility of governments in the digital commons? 
How does it intersect with the existing structures? And how do democratic societies ensure access? And for us, these kind of questions are sort of all subordinated to this broader idea of, and you're going to love this, this is a great German kind of neologism, one of those really kind of complex compound nouns, digitale Daseinsvorsorge, right? Which roughly translates as kind of general service provision in the digital realm, right? So this idea that really the role of the state is to ensure access and the use of these open source software projects because so many people are kind of dependent upon them. And it's the responsibility of the state at the same time to ensure as far as that's possible that these projects are well maintained, uh, are secure uh, and accessible. Um, for us, <laughs> and this is where it gets fun, I guess, um, that means an awful lot of procurement. That means an awful lot of the state essentially creating contracts with these individual maintainers, these individual software projects, and saying, okay, like, what work is it that you need to do? And how can we give you the resources uh, to do that? And essentially paying these people to do the work on the projects that everyone main, uh, is reliant on. And why do we do this? Well, it's because of, you know, a few really obvious reasons, and a few of them are kind of tied, I guess, to the examples that Poen mentioned earlier, like Log4J. It's because uh, digital infrastructure really underpins economic innovation, competition, and resilience. It's also, in a sense, kind of invisible, right? This stuff is really only kind of present when it breaks. That's when people begin to care. And in a sense, we're trying to address that problem uh, and get in there before anything goes wrong. Right, to maintain these projects. Um, and finally, you know, there's arguably a market failure here. Right? This is a kind of classic tragedy of the commons problem. These are projects that are massively sort of oversubscribed but under-maintained. And so this is really where we think in the realm of digital infrastructure that the state has to and should intervene. And perhaps a couple of words as you know, we were discussing sort of open source ecosystems. Um, there's this great phrase, analogy, that we use when we think about open source, that it's free as in puppy, right? And that means that it needs maintenance, it needs looking after, right? Um, you know, you can't just take it for granted. You have to care for these ecosystems that everyone is kind of reliant upon. Uh, and from the kind of self-interest of, you know, government bodies and public administration, that's kind of important because open source is extremely important for digitalization in public administration, right? Increasingly in the German context, you know, you're seeing an explosion of open source projects being used in public services. And if that stuff goes wrong, it's, it's important and kind of crucial for citizens, for companies, for organizations, uh, and it's something that we need to address. The other aspect of open source that I think is kind of where we come in and this kind of framing of the sovereign tech fund between nerds, if you like, uh, on the other hand, and you know, the kind of formal institutional structures of government is that we have people on our team who really understand open source, who come from these kind of communities, who have been embedded in these ecosystems for a long time and can kind of do the work of explaining and translating you know, how these differing governing structures in open source projects work what the terminology is, what you know, technical debt is, and so on and so forth, and making it a kind of a, a, an area in which government can intervene meaningfully through this instrument called the Sovereign Tech Fund. Um, we also definitely kind of view this as a matter of a, the sort of broader duty of care that the government has, right? That if the government is going to use open source in uh, public administration, then on the flip side of that is that it needs to contribute and maintain, right? Um, and all of that leads, I guess, into the kind of broader consensus of this idea, as Billion mentioned, of public money and public code, right? If you're going to put in uh, money into these open source projects, then it also needs to be public. And this is a, one of the kind of foundational kind of aspects of the Sovereign Tech Fund. The projects that we support are purely open source. They're under free licenses for everyone to use. And that's a key, key, key kind of criteria for us when it comes to our funding. And briefly, you know, what does this look like? What are a couple of the kind of case studies or sort of examples? Well, um, one of the key projects that we support is Fortran. And I don't know if there are any kind of climate research nerds here in the audience at the moment. 
But um, you may be familiar with Fortran. Um, uh, it's a high-performance computing language, and uh, it dates back a few years, <laughs> like originally created in the 1950s. Um, but it's increasingly gaining traction and use uh, for climate research uh, projects and kind of high computational models. Um, and it's an under-maintained project in some respects, right? A lot of people are reliant on this to do their research, and yet it doesn't have the resources it needs to be kind of secure and properly maintained. And so this is a project that we've now kind of invested in three times, in 2022, 2023, and uh, this year in 2024. Um, for a total budget of, I think, 116,000, 816,000, sorry. Um, and it's a really good instance of precisely the kind of project that needs support um, and that we kind of focus on. Um, I think Poen's going to talk briefly about OpenJS. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, so our second case study and uh, that we want to share is a little bit about the OpenJS Foundation uh, who we've partnered with. Um, I know. I just realized that both of these projects have very similar funding amounts, and we fund actually a broad range. So sometimes there's projects that are, I think our minimum currently is around 150,000 euros, um, and I think the biggest one is maybe a little bit more, so close to 1 million. Um, and over, basically, uh, the bigger projects are often, uh, and this is a ex good example of that, actually several different things that are uh, encapsulated into one that we're working with, for example, the OpenJS Foundation to improve the JavaScript ecosystems, uh, infrastructure, and security. So um, one of my, so there's, what I find actually fascinating is this whole structure of uh, open source foundations and how now also through some regulation in the European Union, they're becoming um, what they call stewards in this um, uh, Cyber Resilience Act uh, framework. But in this case, the OpenJS Foundation hosts over, I think around 40 of the most widely used JavaScript projects. Um, and one of the things that we're doing in, a, in a, um, in addition to helping them improve their infrastructure, uh, or they're doing the work, we're just providing the funding for it. Always important to, to put that emphasis on it. Um, the reliability, and there's a lot of uh, pressure on these core JavaScript maintainers because it is used, JavaScript is used in so many different places. Um, I don't know actually if I put it in the description, but one of the cool things that we're also working with the OpenJS Foundation is on responsible sunsetting. So there are some projects um, which are basically no longer really used or no longer really maintained. And um, they want to encourage people to stop using them. And what are some responsible guidelines and policies you can put in place to say, OK, this um, will be maintained up until this date, or we are going to start phasing out these older versions. Um, I think they're just working on that now in sort of the long term, um, because we've been working with them since last year through the end of this year. And I'm excited to see what it means to, uh, as I call it, like. Does it still spark joy? Can we let it go? It's like a Marie Kondo kind of thing. Um, don't tell them I said that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure JavaScript always sparks joy in people. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, that is basically uh, the end of it. We wanted to conclude with, uh, to return to the opening question of um, what is the relationship or what are the relationships between nerds and governments? And we think it's one that's still uh, waiting to be written. Um, it's to be continued, sorry, that's what TBC stands for. Um, we are in the process and we're hoping to, uh, through the example of the Sovereign Tech Fund, to find new areas uh, of government mission and where there can be some responsibility taken for this thing called digital infrastructure. Um, it also includes managing a lot of structural change and transitions around digitalization. So Paul spoke a little bit about the challenges of public administrations and digitalization, the different projects and what it means to Sorry to say the word again, but procure things. Um, is it just a one-on-one, -on -one, like we're going to go to a vendor and buy something, or if you're using open source software, which we want governments to use open source software, how do you engage, how do you contribute, how do you shape the direction, and not just be, uh, not necessarily like a freeloader, because you're hopefully paying money, but also to give feedback and to say there's like, if we're using this tool or if we're using this library, what are the use cases that are important for us? Um, what are the things that need to be implemented and how can we shape and support those communities that are doing the work and, and pay them, of course, that's always a thing. So um, is there anything else that you wanted to add to this section? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's important to note is that part of the reason why we're here is because we also want to learn and we want to have a dialogue with people who are working on related topics, right? I mean, the Sovereign Tech Fund ideally shouldn't exist in isolation. There's you know, should be models and variations of what we're trying to do to support the broader kind of open source ecosystem. So 
we really want to hear ideas and enter into a conversation with people who might have suggestions for what we could do otherwise or how else you know you might find instruments to support open source digital infrastructure yeah and we're here to empower you if you want to start one in your country we will tell you everything we've learned all the things that you can avoid the problems so please come and talk to us but yeah. we're actually looking forward to your questions now i guess so, yeah, yeah. Session, uh, feel free to provide any questions if you have any with like Poet and Paul. And either in English or Mandarin can be possible. Uh, first might be Isabel, right? Oh, okay. Th thanks for sharing your wonderful experiences. Oh, it's very inspiring. And my question is, um, so um, I think we are facing the um, uh, industrial revolution empowered by AI technology at this moment. So um, does your fund uh, will focus on this kind of like uh, data sets for um, the individual or language? Like, uh, because in Taiwan, uh, the, we use uh, traditional Chinese, uh, and the, that's a very small portion uh, of the data uh, in the whole world. So uh, I think we need to do something uh, to put some effort to improve this situation. Uh, I'm not sure about the uh, Germany's uh, situation but in this, but there could be a cultural war in the, large, in the world of a uh, large language model. So uh, I would like to know what, what do you think about this issue? Sure. Um, I think it's important to say that um, data isn't really one of our kind of primary focuses. Um, and I think for the Sovereign Tech Fund, we're really sort of focusing on these kind of more foundational technologies, right? Um, that are in a way sort of upstream uh, of questions of uh, AI. Um, and I think it's also not unreasonable to say that there's a lot of actors in the kind of AI space. Uh, and really we're a bit more niche than that uh, and really fixated on kind of established uh, projects. I mean, Curl is a good instance of this, right? Curl has been going for 30 years now. Um, and if something goes wrong with Curl, that's a big, big problem because it's used on millions of devices around the world, right? Um, and so we want to ensure that those projects that are kind of established and proven and critical, in a sense, um, get the support they need. Uh, and in a sense, I guess, like AI and data is a whole new set of sort of emerging technologies that really isn't our focus. But having said that, um, there are a number of initiatives in Germany, uh, like the, o the Data Institute that was put forward by the, um, I guess the translation would be the kind of uh, home office or, you know, sort of domestic uh, ministry, which is about kind of data sharing uh, and establishing, kind of moving towards that kind of data trust model in a way. Um, but that isn't related necessarily to what we do at the Sovereign Tech Fund. Um, so I think, you know, to wrap it up, like we acknowledge that that's a set of issues and maybe a set of problems, but it's not one that we focus on. Um, Thanks. Um, um, should I just go pick the next yeah, question? Yeah, because it's okay. quite a lot of questions. Yeah, really. okay. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to, um, I, I wanted to just make the joke that Curl is actually used not just on this planet, but on other places too, because <laughs> apparently it's on like saddle, or, um, the, the rovers or something like that. Um, something really cool that I found out. Um, let me start with um, what is the relationship with Sprint uh, and STF, and then we can talk about Sovereign. Um, maybe Paul, if you want to think about that, um, not to put that in your lap. But um, basically, uh, Sprint is our, the current sort of official organization that, that's hosting us. It is the German Federal Agency for Disruptive Innovation, and they were basically, when the Sovereign Tech Fund was spun up very quickly, like created very quickly, um, a willing host for the small team that we're building right now. So. Basically, they, um, they're an incubator, incubator of many sort of knowledge transfer projects within the German um, academic scene and lots of other things which I cannot explain because they were fairly separate from them. Right now, we're under their umbrella because they already had like, you know, HR and they could hire people and uh, procurement, you know, officers and things like that. And we're in the process right now of becoming a subsidiary of Sprint, which means we'll be kind of a more separate organization still under them as an official holding company, but we'll... Um, that makes us a little bit more permanent, gives us like a separate um, legal entity from Sprint, and that's um, sort of where we'll go from here. Um, but 
to answer sort of maybe the question of the theory of change, we worked with them because they were willing to hire people, hire us basically in these early first years and be able to do that quickly and not have to go through the, you know, when you incorporate something, especially in the government context, it takes a while. There's like documents of incorporation, lots of people have to sign up, all that sorts of things. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump in on the question at the top there, which um, if you can't see it, it's uh, you clarified sovereign doesn't mean nationalism. But still, is it a rhetorically useful term for convincing one nation to fund work benefiting OS users globally? Uh, and I think the implicit framing of that question is exactly correct in some ways. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you are sort of have an understanding of the kind of more formalized European digital governance sort of policy sphere, but um, the term or the, the use of the term uh, sovereign really is subordinated to this kind of broader concept of digital sovereignty in Europe, right, in the European context, which means that it's sort of uh, somewhere between the kind of American model and the sort of more authoritarian Chinese model, like trying to figure out, you know, how to kind of manage uh, the digital space in some ways in a way that is in line with European values, I guess, right? Um, and in a sense, like, that question of sovereign is really, as we came back to that kind of core definition at the beginning, it's about the freedom of individuals and organizations and governments to use these technologies as they wish. Uh, and for us, we would really like to see more countries adopt a similar model, a similar approach to addressing that question of digital sovereignty. And so, again, looping back to that kind of, yeah, that kind of claim earlier, we want to be a sort of model for others to replicate. Although we do concede that like sovereign is a kind of tricky term. Um, Are there yeah. any questions in the room? Yeah, I know anyone? Been... I know we're kind of talking at you and reading from this. So. <laughs> <laughs> but not in Taiwanese, because I, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what are our, th uh, from Ian, what are your thoughts on company comp contributions to public code? Um, and what about the national attacker to public code regarding civic digital infrastructure? So for the first part of that, um, maybe we can clarify the second part. So the first part is, um, we are, we welcome, we encourage, um, we're always in dialogue actually with industry actors um, because we believe there needs to be more support and funding for open source generally. So it's not, we're not trying to replace anything that, um, and this is not to absolve um, private uh, corporations of responsibility for supporting um, and sort of ensuring that their um, software continues to work based on the things that they're using that are open source. So we encourage that. Um, we still have some, we don't really have any um, ready ideas to say, oh, we're gonna partner with any particular uh, uh, private sector corporations, but I think we're open to the idea and would love to open more dialogue. If you are part of a large international corporation, come and talk to us. <laughs> and um, does anybody know what this second part of the question might mean? But I'm... Um, We've got 30 seconds left. Okay, um, and basically we are focused to answer the next question. A late stage in the sense of our, our focus is really on things that are overused and um, are over, like that are used a lot. So often new projects are not in that, or used, for the most part new projects are not in that area. Things that are infrastructure where if you remember the comic, if that one part pulls out that it all falls down and for a lot of people um, and for uh, social, socially vulnerable areas. All right. Cool. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.